Welcome to part two of morning prayer. We are turn now to our church history lections for Aaron. In Hebrew tradition, Moses is brother. He's first mentioned in the narrative of Moses' vision on Mount Harold. It's Exodus 4, 14. When Jehovah signs him to Moses as his assistant. Jehovah afterwards appointed him and his descendants to be priests, Exodus 28, 29, Numbers 8 and 18, an office he kept despite his sharing, his share in setting up the golden calf, Exodus 32, 1 to 6. The power of his priestly intercession is emphasized in the story of staying the plague, Numbers 16. And his authority is miraculously confirmed by the budding rod. Number 17. Aaron's priesthood, whose chief function was the offering of an acceptable sacrifice to God, gave him a unique position. He was the head of his sons and the Levites. He alone offered incense in the Holy of Holies and mediated between God and the people. And like a king, he was anointed and crowned with a diadem and tiara, Exodus 28. He is thus in Christian theology, a type of Christ. This conception of Aaron as at once foreshadowing and being replaced by him is worked out, especially in the epistle to the Hebrews, for the superiority of the perfect sacrifice of Calvary to the animal sacrifices of the Aaronic priesthood is established. For critical theories on the growth of the Aaronic priesthood, see modern works on the Old Testament. We turn now to the first period of church history with the Synod of Jerusalem. They took no exception and made no addition to his gospel. On the contrary, when they saw that God gave grace and strength to Peter for the apostleship of the circumcision, and gave grace and strength to Paul for the conversion of the uncircumcised, they extended to him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Give me a second here. We've got a book binding problem again from these overworked textbooks. And also for the conversion of the uncircumcision, they extended to him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship with the understanding that they would divide as far as practicable the large field of labor, that Paul should manifest his brotherly love and cement the union by aiding in the support of the poor, often persecuted and famine-stricken brethren of Judea. The service of charity had cheerfully done, as cheerfully and faithfully did afterward by raising collections among his Greek congregations and carrying the money in person to Jerusalem. Footnote 1 te gives you the biblical texts. Such is the unequivocal testimony of fraternal understanding among the apostles from the mouth of Paul himself. And the letter of the council officially recognizes this by mentioning beloved Barnabas and Paul as men who've hazarded their lives for the name of Jesus Christ. His double testimony of the unity of the apostolic church is quite conclusive against the modern invention of an irreconcilable antagonism with Peter. Barnabas, as the older disciple, still retained precedence in the Jewish church and hence is named first. Dr. Plumpter remarks against the two Bingen critics of all doctrines as to the development of the Christian church, that which sees in Peter, James, and John the leaders of the Judaizing anti-Pauline party is perhaps the most baseless 
and fantastic. The fact that their names were unscrupulously used by that party, both in their lifetime and as the pseudo-Clementine homilies and recognition showed after the death, cannot outweigh their own deliberate words and acts. Good old tubing and troublemakers. Turning to the Middle Ages and Christian charity, 590 to 1049. The supreme duty of charity was inculcated by all faithful pastors and teachers of the gospel from the beginning. In the apostolic and anti-Nicene ages, it was exercised by regular contributions on the Lord's Day, and especially at the communion and the agape connected with it. Every congregation was a charitable society and took care of the widows and orphans, strangers and prisoners, and sent help to distant congregations in need. After constant Constantine, when the masses of the people flocked into the church, charity assumed an institutional form and built hospitals, houses of refuge for strangers, the poor, the sick, the aged, the orphans. There are Xenocodium and Xenodokia for strangers, Tokium or Tokophrium for the poor, Orphanotrophium for orphans, Breftophium for foundlings, houses for the sick, for the aged, for widows. In Latin, hospitium, hospitale, see Dr. de Grange. Such institutions were unknown among the heathen. For the houses near the temples of Osinolipius were only intended for a temporary shelter, not for care and attendance. The Emperor Julian's involuntary eulogy of the charity of the Galileans, as he contemptuously called the Christians, and his abortive attempt to force the heathen to imitate it, are well known. They appear first in the East, but soon afterwards in the West. Fabiola founded a hospital in Rome, Pacamachius one in Portus Romanus, Paulus one in Nola. At the time of Gregory I, there were several hospitals in Rome. He mentions also hospitals in Naples, Sicily, and Sardinia. These institutions were necessary in the greatly enlarged sphere of the church. The increase of poverty, distress, and disaster, which at last overwhelmed the Roman Empire. They may in many cases have served as purposes of ostentation, superseded or excused private charity, encouraged idleness, and thus increased rather than diminished pauperism. But these were abuses to which the best human institutions are subject. We turn now to Calvin and his return. To Geneva. Calvin wrote to the Council of Geneva from Nucatel on September 7, explaining the reasons for his delay. The next day he proceeded to Bern and delivered letters from Strasbourg and Basel. He was expected at Geneva on the 9th of September, but did not arrive, it seems, before the 13th. He wished to avoid a noisy reception for which he had no taste. He says in the preface to his commentary on Psalms, I have no intention of sewing, showing myself and making a noise in the world. He wished to avoid a noisy reception, but there is no doubt that his arrival caused general rejoicing among the people. The council provided for the reformer a house and garden in Rue de la Chanoine near St. Peter's Church. Footnote 5. It was the house of Sieur Fresnel between the 
House of Bonavard on the west, and that of Abbey de Mont on the east, where Calvin lived from 1543 until his death. But as this house was not ready on his arrival, he lodged for a while in the adjoining house of the abbot of Bonmont, which was rebuilt in 1708, and passed into the possession of Adrian Naville, resident of the Society Evangelique. The second house, number 11, remained a reformed parsonage until 1700. In 1834, it was acquired by the Roman Catholic clergy, who assigned it to the sisters of Vincent de Paul, but it is now owned by the state. And promised him, <coughs> in consideration of his great learning and hospitality to strangers, a fixed salary of 50 golden dollars or 500 florins, besides 12 measure of wheat and two casks of wine. Calvin's annual income at nine to 10,000 francs of our money, $2,000. A syndic at that time received only 100, a counselor 25 francs. It also voted him a new suit of broadcloth for furs for the winter. This provision was liberal for those days, yet barely sufficient for the necessary expenses of the reformer and the claims on his hospitality. Hence, the council made occasional presents for extra services, but he declined them whenever he could do without them. He lived in the greatest simplicity compatible with his position. A pulpit in St. Peter's was prepared for him upon a broad, low pillar that the whole congregation might more easily hear him. Prof. McCulloch on Cranmer. Page 190, a Reformed Church. It is notable that this section in the text on orders is virtually identified, identical with that published in autumn, even though the draft itself was no later. than March, an agreed version of a statement on confirmation now separated from the Holy Order's statement has strikingly similar list of signatories it is clear that much, of, that much the same date in winter and early spring as Alicia has shown us. The Synod was first disposed to the contention over the sacraments festering since the previous summer. Cranmer also gives clear negative evidence that the sacramental section was finished first and early in a letter to Cromwell in the following July. In this he describes the bishops as nearly finishing their work, but he only mentions the non-sacramental sections of the bishop's book, Paternoster, Ave Maria, Creed, and Commandments. Other documents of much the same date in spring reflect the subcommittees often with particular axes to grind. Thus, a conservative collection of bishops, Clerk, Stokesley, Longland, Tunstall, and Rugga, got together to sign a short but ringing defense of shrines and pilgrimages, which did not make it into the final text of the bishop's book. We might even attribute to this date one unusually specialized subcommittee Latimer celebrated a literary duel on paper with Henry VIII on the subject of purgatory. Although it might equally well belong to the previous year in this fascinating document, Henry was on top form in his marginal comments, trouncing Latimer's rather stumbling efforts to deny purgatory's existence. 
the sermons and remains of Latimer. Cranmer got a secretary to prepare a set of notes on the seven sacraments, which probably represents the agreements reached in discussion. Ashley now notes how Lutheran in tone they are, maintaining the special character of the three sacraments, although acknowledging and discussing the total of seven, just as the bishop's book was eventually to do. Nall points out their similarities in ideas and phrasing to Melanchthon's Locke Communis, dedicated it and presented to Henry <coughs> in 1535, but also to the Wittenberg articles brought back by Fox in 1536. Likewise, it may be at this time that the Archbishop's secretaries under his direction began compiling a source book of quotations and comments on a classified list of theological questions. This now survives in the British Library as two massive volumes, which Null has christened, and christened Cranmer's great calm commonplaces. They were certainly begun no later than 1538, and Cranmer and his secretarial team continued adding to them until the end of Henry VIII's reign and became the anchor of his omnivorous theological reading. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Westminster Confession, Chapter 11, Paragraph 3. Christ, by his obedience and death, did fully discharge the debt of all those that are justified and did make a proper, real, and full satisfaction to his Father's justice in their behalf. Yet inasmuch as he was given by the Father for them and his obedience and satisfaction accepted in their stead and both freely, not for anything in them, their justification is only of free grace that both the exact justice and rich grace of God might be glorified in the justification of sinners. Now for the formula of Concord, the internecine Lutheran conflicts. As regards the states of humiliation ex omnitio, and exaltation, exaltatio, the formula. And these passages already quoted teaches the full possession, thesis, and a partial or occult use of the divine attributes by Christ from the moment of his existence as man. His human nature and not the divine preexistent logos is understood to be the subject of humiliation in the classical passage. Philippians 2 7, on which the distinction of the two states is based. Consequently, the two states refer properly only to the human nature and consist in a difference of outward condition and visible manifestation. But humiliation is a partial concealment of the actual use, a crupsis kreseos of the divine attributes communicated to the human nature at the Incarnation. The exaltation is a full manifestation of the same. As to the extent of the concealment or actual use, 
arose afterwards, as we've already seen, a controversy between Giesen and the two Bingham divines, but was never properly settled, nor can it be settled on the Christological basis of the formula. The modern school of Lutheran canonicists depart from it by assuming a real self-renunciation kenosis of the divine Lagos in the Incarnation, but there they, but thereby they endanger the immutability of the deity and inter interrupt the continuity of the divine government of the world through the Lagos. We had some general remarks on the Christology of the formula as far as it differs from the Reformed Christology. After renewed investigation of this difficult problem, I have been confirmed by the conviction that the exegetical argument, which must ultimately decide the case, is in favor of the Reformed against the Lutheran theory. But I cheerfully admit that the latter represents a certain mystical and speculative element which is not properly appreciated by it in the Calvinistic theology and which may act as a check on Nestorian tendencies. Wasn't that interesting? Now we turn to the infallibilists on the kingdom and the exile, paragraph 709 and 710. The Expectation of the Messiah and His Spirit, 7.11 and 7.12. The law, the sign of God's promise and covenant, ought to have governed the hearts and institutions of that people to whom Abraham gave birth. Good morning. Uh, yes, hi, Mary. Uh, surgery was a great success. Um, I'm seeing much better long distance, but I have to have some over-the-counter glasses for reading, which this is 2.75. I was shocked by that, but without these, I can't do reading. Now, maybe that will resolve. It's only been three, day, three or four days since I got the surgery, but definitely the long range and middle range uh, sight is much improved. So good to see you, and it's good to be back. It took a few days to kind of get uh, reoriented. Back to our infallibleist friends. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But after David, Israel gave in to the temptation of becoming a kingdom like other nations. A kingdom, however, the object of the promise made to David would be the work of the Holy Spirit. It would belong to the poor according to the Spirit. Paragraph 710. The forgetting of the law and infidelity to the covenant end in death. It is the exile, apparently the failure of the promises, which in fact, the mysterious fidelity of the Savior God in the beginning of the promised restoration the people of God had to suffer this purification. In God's plan, the exile already stands in the shadow of the cross and the remnant of the poor that returns from the exile is one of the most transparent prefigurations of the church. Expectation of the Messiah and his spirit. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Two prophetic lines were to develop one leading to the expectation of the Messiah, the other pointing to the announcement of a new spirit. They converge in the small remnant, the people of the poor, who await the consolation of Israel and the redemption of Jerusalem. We have seen earlier how Jesus fulfills the prophecies concerning himself. We limit ourselves here to those which the relationship of the Messiah and his spirit appears more clearly. The characteristics that awaited Messiah begin in the book of Emmanuel, 
Isaiah said this when he saw his glory, speaking of Christ, especially in the first two verses of Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And I am not a Roman Catholic for several reasons, but they do better than the decadent process theologians of Protestantism. Who are all over the map. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Do thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, may clean our hearts within us. O God, who has prepared for those who love thee such good things as pass man's understanding, pour into our hearts such a love toward thee, that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, and knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we surely trusting in thy defense may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, that all our doings being ordered by thy governments may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and whose power is infinite, have mercy upon this nation and so rule the hearts of those in authority, especially President Biden, and that they, knowing whose ministers they are, may above seek all things, it to thy honor and glory, and that we and all in this nation, duly considering whose authority they bear, may faithfully and obediently honor them, according to thy blessed promise and ordinance. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone works great marvels, send down upon our bishops and pastors and all congregations committed to their charge the helpful spirit of thy grace, that they may truly please thee pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now for spoken and unspoken requests. David, for the two Roberts, for Dave, who lost his wife, Vicki, for Linda facing medical procedures for our children and especially our grandchildren that they may be strong in the Lord and for unspoken requests
Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. And as promise that we're two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou will grant the requests. Fulfill now, Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all now and forevermore world without end. Amen. Here ends the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. Good to see you, Mary. Good to be back. Good to rejoice and pray and speak to our sovereign God who hears the whispers of our minds and hearts and to whom we present our minds, bodies, and hearts for his daily illumination, guidance, and support. We'll be back a little bit later. And again, good to see you, Mary. Godspeed.